Hey, you deal with them at three thirty. I apologize for being a bit late. Um, so leave that matter to three thirty. At this juncture, I would like to invite you to public officers to join us. Um, I would like to follow up on the issues that it, that are within our remit. Last time we cancelled the meeting. Why? Is it because of the overrunning of the House Committee or the Finance Committee? House Committee. So the last meeting was cancelled, and therefore we have some catching up to do. Uh, because this subcommittee is subject to a sunset clause, and we have to finish our business. I understand that some members have some urgent issues to attend to at three thirty. I must apologize that perhaps at three thirty we have to call it a day. I must apologize, but I'm sorry, but in fact um quite a lot of members quite in attendance today need to rush to another event at three thirty. First of all, confirmation of minutes of the meeting held on the 29th of January 2013, it has been sent to you via paper CB bracket 1743-12-13. to 13. We haven't received any proposed amendments, so minutes confirmed. Next, we're supposed to deal with, first of all, the current legislation and administrative measures on the control of air pollution and the associated Proper expenditure in the following areas the power sector as well as the uh, vehicles um, paper c b bracket one four seven four slash twelve to thirteen bracket zero one has been sent to you last time. Of course, we can ask the administration to give us a very brief introduction, but I understand that the under secretary can s dispense with the uh, briefing. You can trust that we've all read the paper. Why don't we go into the discussion directly? So, members, please indicate your wish to speak. There is only one member wishing to ask questions. So, Miss Claudia Mo, no time limit. And at most, we've only got four members here, other than myself. So, I don't think we need to be that um, rigid and confine ourselves to say a few minutes each. Um, Claudia, thank you, Madam Chair. I find it regrettable that we have such a low um, attendance rate. It appears that air pollution hasn't received sufficient attention even at the Legislative Council. Air pollution, I understand that the Under Secretary has always been an expert in this field. I don't actually have much to follow up or to pursue. Um, let's continue to work. To me, noise, pollution, I think if we reduce it at, core, at a source, then it will be fine. But to me, I'm more concerned about light pollution. We haven't got a piece of legislation against light pollution. In the past, I used to share the common view. Miss Claudia Mo, uh, allow me to interrupt you. For light pollution, um, unnecessary lighting, whether it should be regulated. In future meetings, we'll deal with it. Not now. You don't allow me to tackle it now. Not for the time being. Let's dwell on power supply and um, vehicles. Let's deal with the relevant policies as well as the public expenditure. Yes, uh, a question about vehicles. From the Transport and Housing Bureau as well as the Development Bureau, what they are doing is public car parks, multi-storey car parks will be demolished. A case in point is the one in Yamate. It will not be reprovisioned. For Ramsey Street, it will be reprovisioned. For Middle World, 
I understand that it enjoys a sea view. It is on a premium site, uh, but you can imagine that vehicles have to cruise around to look for a parking space. It will cause unnecessary air pollution, and the vehicles will be trapped in a traffic jam, and motorists would keep on hooting the horn. We've been told that there will be a joint study with the Environment, Environment Bureau. But what is happening? Either we curb the growth of private cars or we ban private cars for the Yangmate multi-story public car park. I've been using it for many, many years. When it is gone, where, where can I go? Where should I go? I've been pressing different policy bureaus. They say that they would liaise with the Environment Bureau but it seems that we never get any answer. I have some doubt as to whether it is um, in relation to the THB rather than the Environment Bureau. But I understand that bus rationalization, bus route rationalization programs are also uh, within this um, topic. So I permit the question. Well. Even um, Green Sense would agree with us that the multi-story public car parks should be reprovisioned. Usually, they would prefer a green mode of transport, but still, they would agree with us. So, what is your reply? I try to see if I can answer your question. Maybe we shouldn't be using the Q and A mode uh, in this case. Ms. Mo, for the question that you asked, probably we have to resort to new and coordinated policies. We have already started discussion with other policy bureaus, and I can share some information with you. From the perspective of the Environment Bureau, the inner pipe emission is, of course, our business. For road traffic, it is beyond us. It is within the portfolio of the transport department. But of course, you can say that this is part and parcel of the same thing. And I agree with Ms. Mo in that um, we need to see how government departments are cooperating. Uh, what I can say is that, though not in all areas, but at least in some areas, we have already started some interdepartmental discussion. Madam Chair, just now you have said that for the bus route rationalization program, um, it is pertinent to this uh, meeting. Uh, the less time you spend on a bus as a passenger, the better for your health. And then when you're walking on the road, uh, a lower level of roadside pollution would, of course, be beneficial to your health. And therefore, uh, we will be interested to find out whether traffic is smooth. If there is always traffic congestion, then you spend more time on the bus. And when you're standing by the roadside, you will suffer from the roadside pollution. So we need to reduce the flow. We are at the moment looking at the case of buses. When the THB draws up this policy, of course, in principle, we strongly support the idea. As you must have already read in the papers, we are joining hands with the THB in tackling this problem. We are only making a start and they want to do some fine tuning to see how the bus routes can be rationalized first to smooth to smoothen the traffic and it will not just benefit air quality it will also bring about convenience to the bus passengers because it would cut short their journey time in terms of emission 
will try to chip in by doing the calculations. We go together with the THB when we attend the district council meetings. The THB and the TD have a role to play and will be very interested to cooperate with them in the development of policies. Recently, we have also touched upon the topic of vehicle examination. Well, uh, in Hong Kong, sometimes the repair maintenance of vehicles aren't properly, properly carried out. So we're making the first step and we hope that the vehicle inspection centers can be expanded. So we've already started some discussion. What about the park and ride concept? Can you not elaborate on this point? That is for the Yamate uh, public car park. Can it sort of um, accommodate motorists coming from the new territories on and, and take a, a train ride? I'm sorry, I can't give an answer to such a degree of details. From the transport point of view, I've been told that it won't be a problem. I'm not sure whether you're familiar with Temple Street and Shanghai Street. It is a tourist attraction. You always have traffic congestions caused by coaches. Of course, they can't be accommodated in the public car parks. And then in the future, there will be many vehicles um, coming down. Now, they have dismissed our case by saying that there won't be a problem. Now, I see it this way. If you just ask a single policy bureau, it may not be easy for us to give an answer. I'm not trying to dodge the issue. If I can't answer a question, I will frankly tell you, Mr. Lai. For the reprovisioning of the Yamate multi story public car park, it hasn't been uh, steered by us. Perhaps I have to go back and check with the THB and we'll try to see if the Environment Bureau can have something to contribute to. Now, you're saying that up to now, the other police bureaus haven't approached you to talk about the impact on air pollution with the disappearance of such public car parks. Can you confirm that point? I myself haven't had any direct contact with others on this point. As to whether other colleagues have done so, I have to go back and check. Three members have raised their hands to ask questions, so I have to start to introduce a time limit. And um, we, we don't have a very tight timetable. I would. Um, say 10 minutes instead of five, so that we won't be that rushed. Zhong Xu Gan, Bu Ji Wei, and then Chan Hong Ban, and Guo Wei Kang. Good. Mr. Christopher Chung, thank you. I would like to ask about the emission of uh, p patrol vehicles. I heard some drivers saying that if they don't have maintained a vehicle very well, then the emission will be uh, not healthy. So I would like to ask, how does it impact our health? Furthermore, we're saying we want to renew these vehicles because they are about to expire. Now, I only take taxis every day, and I find a lot of taxi drivers are saying that a lot of new vehicles, it's not very, uh, combi it does not combine well with the new type of fuel. So if they don't uh, work well, then there will be a problem. So I would like to know what is the problem here? Can we improve it? And can the factory produce some uh, new components that will allow this to be compatible? Third, why is it that we don't think about uh, electrically powered taxis? Because in Shenzhen, I find that there are a lot of blue taxis that are electric, electrically powered. And I've uh, been inside one of them, and it feels pretty good. 
So Hong Kong is very small. I hear drivers that if they uh, use uh, electricity-powered vehicles, then they would have to recharge for every four hours. Now, I think that it would be feasible in Hong Kong for taxi drivers as long as we have uh, better facilities. Can we uh, introduce electricity vehicles in Hong Kong like in, in Shenzhen is doing it now? So I'd like to ask these three questions in regards to public transportation, specifically taxis. I think there's a two main groups of uh, questions. One is about emissions. Now, we have done a comprehensive uh, work on LPG emissions, and my colleague can explain this later. Second, it's about electrically powered taxis. I think in principle we all agree with this. The problem is If right now uh, we have LPG taxis and we want to uh, change them to even more uh, clean fuel vehicles, such as electricity powered, so we have to think about how we should do this. Now, if in the mainland they want to uh, launch a policy, it may be easier in some aspect. I think our members here will understand that in Hong Kong, the taxi industry has, uh, in terms of the licensing, has a lot of different. Uh, issues. So how do we ask them to uh, buy a more expensive vehicle? So let's say we do launch a policy that we want to have uh, so many electricity powered vehicles in certain years. So how should we do this in terms of the process? How do we handle the difference in price? So, in the, so we have not thought about this in a concrete way. But in Hong Kong, everyone knows that there are some electric, electrically powered vehicles that are being used, that is taxis. But if we look at the long-term planning, this is something that we should do in terms of a policy development. So we are interested in, in working in this direction, but we need to think, think about this more. I would like to ask about this, like have we started to a uh, pilot scheme? Is this something that the government is doing with a uh, private enterprise, or is it just by themselves? Uh, let me give some answers to the questions of Mr. Chung. Now, uh, there are around 12 years of LPG taxis in Hong Kong. Now, they are generally cleaner than a diesel fuel, but we do see that if LPG taxis or even light buses, the emission pipe, if they don't uh, change it uh, regularly, then when they're emission uh, and nitrogen oxides it may actually be more than previous ones. So we've discussed it with the uh, industry. So the, our solution is that in last year we have uh, received uh, $150 million from the Finance Committee. So we will subsidize these uh, vehicles to change their emission pipes. So the government will dis offer a one-off fund of to do this. But this a type of component, in terms of pipe, it needs to be changed regularly. Now, in the later, we do ask that the vehicle owners will have to bear this responsibility. Now, and us, the EPD, will increase the enforcement in terms of road. So we use the sensors. If we see that the taxis or light buses are ab above emission standards, then we will enforce this. So uh, we have a subsidy, and we do have an enforcement method to do, deal with this problem. Second, in terms of uh, the LPG quality, right now, in terms of the quality, uh, the, uh, colleagues in other departments have been monitoring this. If we do find this in some irregularities, they will discuss with the supplier Third, in terms of electricity p taxis, as the Under Secretary had said, the government really hopes to launch forth uh, zero emission vehicles on the road. So we have set up a uh, pilot scheme that has, and the fund will uh, encourage uh, industries and other NGOs to use some uh, green vehicles, whether it's an electricity powered vehicle or not, as a testing scheme. So for the funds that we have uh, approved, it's already helped uh, industries to
by uh, electricity powered taxis, coaches, and taxis. We already approved several applications, and they're under a procurement process. The government has some uh, funding subsidy for this because we know that these vehicles may be more expensive. So our principle is to uh, subsidize the difference in prices. So, for example, if a regular taxi is two hundred thousand dollars, and if the new one they're purchasing at four hundred thousand dollars, we will give uh, the difference in price. So to give them an incentive for them to uh, buy these new vehicles. But as everyone knows that the industry wants to try these electricity powered taxis, it's because that in the future uh, their operation costs will be cheaper than LPG. So we hope that through this uh, testing scheme, we'll let the industry have a more confidence in these 95 vehicles and to see that whether there will be a new uh, compatible works need to undergo if we're launching this in a mass scale. So we have a midterm review so we can, um, or even the public can look at this so we know the effectiveness of uh, using electricity powered vehicles. So will there be a plan for a midterm review? Uh, Madam Chair, we will do this. In terms of the green testing fund, uh, we will have a review for for every two years and every half year we will do have another midterm review. So we will periodically give these uh, midterm reviews or perhaps later the comprehensive final report to put it in the website and so uh, everyone who's interested can uh, have a more understanding. And of course we will uh, communicate with the tr colleagues in THB to uh, see what the, some challenges, opportunities with electricity powered vehicles. So I think that from it's been two years since 2011, so I think it's a time to should report to the LegCo. Uh, that is uh, your communications and conclusions with uh, the TD as well as with the industry. In terms of the green testing fund, in terms of electricity powered taxis, if I remember correctly. These uh, items are in the procurement stage, so I don't think that any of the vehicles are running on the transport now. So, the, but the fund was started in 2011 March. Can you let us know some of the midterm reviews? Yes, that should be okay, but uh, maybe not for the new vehicles that I've just said. Yes, uh, Mr. Lai, I would like to ask a question. In terms of uh, this fund, how much money is being used, and how many cars are you testing? So we're always saying that uh, once the money is out, we can monitor it. If it's not a very big fund, then perhaps there won't be a big reaction. But as I understand, after your testing, when you're doing it on a mass scale, you have to come to LegCo, like last year when you were changing the diesel vehicles, uh, changing to the LPG vehicles. So, Mr. Lai, I would like to ask, up to now, how much or how much money have you approved and uh, how many people have been approved and how many vehicles have been approved. So for this uh, pilot green transport fund has uh, 300 million dollars approved by the FC to launch this uh, testing scheme. So since the setting of the fund, that is 2011, we have approved 44 uh, applications and the fund is about uh, 70 million. In terms of uh, these new uh, energy vehicles, that uh, taxis or trucks, in principle, this is a pilot scheme. We will not let the applicants uh, procure on a mass scale to uh, subsidize their operations. So we do have a cap. Each applicant can only have a maximum of nine, 9 million. So if they want to test several vehicles, they cannot uh, go over 9 million so that we can be uh, can help more uh, companies with the scheme. So if we're still talk, if we're talking about mass scheme procurement and if there's a government funding, then uh, we'll use the usual mechanism to come back to the LegCo. Uh, Mr. Wuchiwei. Thank you. I would like to ask uh, two parts. First is about electricity. Now we know there's a midterm review, and we've said many times that in the past, and of the two uh, power companies 
we think there's not a very high standard for uh, lowering emission for them, and there's not much punishment. But I would like to know if there's some uh, new news about this in terms of uh, two power companies and also lowering the emissions. That is uh, their standard as well as uh, what kind of uh, penalties will be imposed if they do not uh, fulfill these standards, and not now. It's just only a voluntary basis. Second, in terms of uh, electricity, the government has a subsidy for power, and there are some criticisms that in terms of a usage of power has increased due to this subsidy. So I would like to ask, will the EB, because of this subsidy, is launching a message that if you are wasting electricity, that is your power usage is more than what you were using last year. So perhaps you shouldn't give a subsidy for those. So now, so and if others can lower their power usage to a certain percentage, they should get a certain bonus as an incentive. So I think that there should be a message that everyone in society should strive to lower our power usage. So I would like to ask this question. Furthermore, the C himself had said a policy about a low carbon living and feels that a Hong Kong society should launch some measures such as uh, low energy uh, vehicles. And now vehicle, uh, bicycle was one of them. And it's also saying that some of the newer communities should allow for a bicycle as a transportation means. Now we see that the p overall policy is saying that the bicycle should only be a leisurely use. And so there are no uh, plans in terms of uh, planning for roads. So now, e so how have you been discussing this? Because this is a connected policy, some has just talked about electricity vehicles. Now cars, everyone understands that because they need to go for a farther distance, it's difficult to persuade a vehicle user to use uh, electricity uh, vehicles because they may be afraid of certain uh, difficulties such as slopes. But if we're talking about a small area, I think electricity-powered bicycles would be uh, good, uh, very, uh, very uh, compatible. But of course, it's very popular in mainland. But there are no plans to uh, consider this type of transportation here. So it seems that uh, the transportation department is excluding this type of vehicle, uh, transportation means. Now some residents are using such uh, bicycles and then were charged by the police. So I think that, do we agree that bicycles have a role to play, or if even electricity-powered bicycles can be used in the road as a transportation means? And it, it can uh, push the whole community to go towards a lower carbon living. Otherwise, I can see that we're using a lot of different, lot of resources to deal with uh, motorized vehicles. These are all very expensive, but in terms of electrically powered bikes, it's rather uh, economic. It's only like a three thousand or five thousand dollars for sale in the mainland. But of course, we have to do a good policy to regulate how they can be used in the road. So I would like to hear the opinions. Now, I. Th I think if you ask for so long, even though you only have 10 minutes, maybe the undersecretary won't have a lot of time to answer. Yes, I understand. Uh, undersecretary, please. Yes, there are two types of questions. One is about uh, power. So I'm sorry, I can only give a standard answer. Because the midterm review, I believe that we cannot devote too many details. But the principle is how to do this. Uh, we don't disagree with this. Because this is true. It requires the consensus of both parties. Well, um, we can stand firm and we say that uh, we have a list of items to be discussed. But then the other side may say that uh, they're not willing to take it up. I think there are two points that are of greatest interest to the public. 
that is, first of all, rate of return of 9.99%, whether that can be adjusted. The other is about energy conservation and uh, whether the public can benefit from energy conservation. We are about to start the bargaining exercise, so it will be difficult for us to uh, divulge uh, too much on this occasion and have too much to be discussed here. Well, I think the FS uh, most popular uh, initiative is to grant a subsidy on electricity bills. Uh, it has been controversial. We know that it is uh, relatively more popular among the public. That's the second po first point. Second point, whether there has been a an increase in the energy consumed as a result of the subsidy. There was a discussion within our bureau. Say, for example, in a particular year, there was a subsidy for the electricity bill. We may see an increase in energy consumption, but can we attribute it to the subsidy? No one can tell. Our colleagues are not too sure whether it is because of the subsidy and so people are wasting energy. We are still unsure as to whether there is a link between the two. Internally, we did ask this question, but we have yet to see very strong evidence for that uh, argument to to stand. Electrically powered uh, bicycles. Well, we need to ask ourselves this question. Do we want to change some priorities? As you all know that bicycles are not regarded as a main means of transport. It is regarded as a form of recreation. If we want to make a change in this regard, and we have to bear in mind personal safety. The other policy bureaus are most concerned about personal safety. So we have to ask ourselves what else have to be done before we can remove the risk. Now in the new territories, there are certain areas where you have the support measures. But what about in the city? What about Hong Kong Island and what about the Kowloon Peninsula? Um, it will be a policy change. Certainly you will have our support, but how are we going to bring about it? Well, for a policy to be developed and formulated, uh, the scope will be much broader. And the Secretary, if I may make a point here, I'm not saying that we should introduce this idea for all the existing roads. I'm just saying that for roads in newly developed areas, you can try it. You need to make the first step. You can't simply say that uh, have it been done on the basis of cycle tracks. Now, for the newly developed areas, I think it is amenable, and also newly constructed roads. Maybe we can make some arrangements. You don't reject bicycles. You don't exclude them from our roads. But I'm just thinking, maybe for newly built roads, you can plan in advance so that you can reserve a lane for bicycles. We aren't actually asking for a cycle track. In this way, those who are interested in riding a bicycle well, as a result of the change of policy, uh, give you their input. So I'm focusing on newly constructed roads and also newly developed areas. And I don't think we're trying to replace the traditional modes of public transport. I'm sure we can have the THB uh, here to take up the issue with you as well. Mr. Chair Kempen, Madam Chair, vehicle emission, fuel standards, and banning of idle engines. All such measures have my support because you are being positive, you are being proactive. We want to reduce the vehicular emission as much as possible. But what about dispersion? And what about 
removing the pollutants. I think it is just as equally important as the control over the fuel standards as well as the idle engines. Um, in the urban areas, we're interested in the air ventilation impacts. Just now, a member talked about Temple Street. It is always seriously congested. What can we do to clear the traffic jams? And can we bring about better ventilation? So in terms of town planning, I want to know if the Bureau can do something in tandem. So other than reducing the emission, maybe we should also remove the pollutants. And then I want to know whether this will be done across the board. That is, are you going to have some benchmarking data, uh, have a air ventilation study for each district, and then you come up with air ventilation index, so that one day when you have redevelopment of a particular area, you can find out whether the redevelopment project will bring about an improvement or a deterioration of the air ventilation index. Will the Bureau do this? And then in recent years, we have seen many buildings being built along the waterfront. And then we have um, more like um, or tower like uh, buildings being built blocking the way of the prevailing winds. So I want to know whether you would do anything to prevent such buildings from cropping up so that it won't be standing in the way of air ventilation. Mr. Chen, well, I think we should focus more on the power sector as well as uh, transport. Of course, uh, town planning would have an impact on transport and has something to do with the dispersion of air pollutants. Under Secretary, it's your turn. Madam Chair, um, we have got certain uh, initiatives here and there, but then for the work to be done on a territory-wide scale, we need to work with other departments and bureaus. In the case of an old urban area, uh, we have to wait a long time before there would be a massive redevelopment project. But still, there are two ways to go about it. First of all, we can reduce the emission from vehicles entering the district. And that's why we have the requirement to ask buses going to such areas to be of Euro 4 standards. We want to see it being done by 2015, so we want to cut the emission at source. Now, for such low emission zones, can it not be expanded? Can we also reject other vehicles in addition to buses? You can imagine that in the case of Chim Sa Che, if you say that you disallow vehicles to go into certain spots, it is a drastic move. And we really have to work with other district councils and other bureaus. And there must be a clear understanding and agreement. That is, um, we have to be very careful about the site selection. Uh, it would be very effective if you ban the vehicles. Um, probably you see the effect when you visit European cities. Now, it is not easy to choose the right uh, areas. And then when there is a conflict between uh, pedestrians and vehicles, um, we will certainly lose out because we will suffer from air pollution. Now, for newly built buildings, as to the air ventilation impact, well, in recent years, we have seen new purchases, that is, the project proponent is asked to measure the air ventilation, and then the building has to be designed in such a way that its height and its orientation will not jeopardize the air ventilation. There are already guidelines for the developers to do so, but still it is a relatively new concept. It is but a set of guidelines. Yes, guidelines only. 
Madam Chair, I would like to bring in town planning. This is because for vehicle engines and fuels, yes, we can do some regulatory work there. But then in the urban areas, other than what has already been done, I just want to know whether the guidelines can be turned into something statutory. And I want to know whether we have some air ventilation data. Yes, development is important, but I just wonder if we can prevent new developments worsening the air quality and the air ventilation. At least we want to know whether air ventilation would indeed be jeopardized. Sometimes we may be objecting to a new project blindly. Sometimes a project may even benefit the air ventilation. Madam Chair, of course I know that today we're supposed to focus on the engines of the vehicles, but still when it comes to air ventilation, we mustn't forget the town planning perspective and then it will make our discussion more comprehensive. Now, if we block the breezeway, the air path, even if there is just one or two, only even if there are just a couple of cars going to that area, the pollution will still be serious. So uh, please, um, Give us an idea about policies. We have the air quality management program. I don't know what the electrical would want to go about it. Now, if you want to talk about policy developments, you must have other bureaus present as well. I'm not sure what would be the best format. Uh, the current approach may not be the most appropriate one because for policy developments, we can't take it forward by having Q&As in this way. Now, reducing emission as source is a very effective means. We mustn't build it to it. But even if we have worked on it, even if we have put in a lot of efforts to do that, if we haven't got other things like traffic management, then it means that we are not reducing emission adequately, and it requires full cooperation. Mr. Chen, uh, Madam Chair, at this moment, I would suggest members consider one point. Now, it is indeed that the Environment Bureau has only a very narrow scope of uh, policies. When we talk about getting other policy bureaus to take part in the debate, I suggest that we ask the THB and the Development Bureau to have a discussion with us. Now, today we're talking about vehicles related issues. We can see from your questions that you are very concerned about transport-related issues and town planning-related issues. So perhaps we can call a meeting and get the THB and the Development Bureau to attend the meeting as well. Yeah. Madam Chair, what I hear from the Under Secretary is that the Bureau is willing to give a map about the airflow. So it's good that we know this. So we know that there is a benchmark about the airflow. I first I must understand it. When you're talking about a uh, airflow map or a blueprint for all of Hong Kong, I don't think that's very appropriate. Uh, that is because, let's say, I used. Let's say if you like demolish some buildings in Hong Kong, then the airflow will change. So if you're saying that we need should find a particular. District, yes, I mean like each district by district level. Now, I must say that I have not undertaken to do this. I have to explain this. Now, the town planning, they are already need to do this when they need to build a new building. But if you do this on a district level, we must understand what we're doing and what uses of would that be. Now, we already have an air pollution blueprint. This is done by uh, four different bureaus, uh, Madam Chair. This is a suggestion. 
you can ask all of us to come and talk about this blueprint. If we do this together, then I think that all of the questions you have today can uh, you can use that to address it. Uh, that's your prerogative. Yes. At this point, I want to suggest to everyone. Now, we have a meet with the Under Secretary. Now, this is, I think, the th the third meeting at least, and we do know that the Environment Bureau has a very uh, rather narrow of scope in terms of powers. That. It, they may give suggestions, but they do need the support of other bureaus. So I'm discussing with the Secretariat so that we'll have a meeting and we'll ask uh, all the relevant bureaus to come and discuss this uh, air pollution blueprint. Now, Hong Kong had in the past has asked uh, scholars from Chinese University to look at the airflow of, of Hong Kong, but I think that was done by a development bureau. Now, for example, in Hong Kong Island, they're saying that uh, some of the wind comes from the north and not from the south. And I think uh, other areas also have a similar analysis. The Development Bureau should be monitoring uh, the airflow of, uh, of the district-wide when they are uh, approving new developments. So that is, so they try to minimize the blockage of air so to try to maximize the airflow in each district. So I think that we can use the blueprints and ask the different bureaus to come. And so we should have at least one meeting where we can have a cross-bureau discussion. And we can also consider to ask different panels to come. Now, but the thing is, if we invite different panels, then I think that almost all of the LegCo members will be here. So we can consider giving all the invitation, invitations to all interested colleagues so to discuss uh, this uh, blueprint. Uh, Madam Chair, of course, we, uh, we're very happy about it and we'll be happy to come. But if you're saying it, if it's only discussing about uh, air pollution, then we will still be the one that's mainly responsible. Now, for example, if you're saying about the rationalization of bus routes, now we're very concerned about this as well because we do know that it can uh, decrease emissions, but we are not responsible for that. If you are telling to uh, different bureaus is that you're interested in this issue and that the supplements and the air pollution is only a supplement. That will be a different effect. So perhaps if you can dis discuss with different panels and we can increase the scope that will actually concern different policies, then it may be easier for all of us to discuss this. So uh, we will communicate this again with uh, members and other ma panels. Next is uh, Mr. Kwok Wai Kung. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. In terms of improving air quality, now of course the industry has uh, given a lot of suggestions and concerns. And we understand that from a Hong Kong-wide level, everyone wants to improve air quality, but I think everyone has a concern that they won't uh, affect the industry too much so that they can't have their jobs or cause certain people to have to retire early. Because now some people in the community are concerned about their jobs because it affects their families. Now, some have mentioned in terms of rationalizing of bus routes, even though the TH the transport department is the main department responsible. So I do have to make some comments. Now, I'm also a district councillor in the Eastern District, and I do hear some discussions about this. So I find that the rationalization, is it the direction, is the objective stemming from uh, air quality? That's not true. 
So what we're doing now, so it's, it seems that sometimes it's actually about helping uh, bus companies make money. And so some of the bus routes, uh, maybe some of the bus routes are go for very long distance. So they do continue to go very long distance, but they only do it through an express. So is the rationalization can really help lower emission. I am doubtful about this. Because in truth, the cars, the buses, even though they are being reorganized, even that they're still in use. Furthermore, if we're talking about cross-harbor uh, buses, we see a lot of empty buses. We have mentioned that uh, we should change the uh, fees in terms of taking these buses so that they can uh, improve the uh, usage of this and so to lower the emissions. But this has never been effective because bus companies have their own thoughts because they want to put uh, the passengers into a certain routes so some of the buses can come back at a quicker point, at a quicker speed. But buses can't, are also limited because they have to stop at bus stops. So in, th in terms of rationalization, if we really want to lower emission through that means, we have to do more. We have to get the transport department and the bus companies should really focus on this. Second, in terms of the labelings for electric appliances, now a lot of um, most of the citizens actually uh, understand this, but it seems that's what we understand. Even if it's the same level of in terms of the label, they have still have differences within the same level. Will you consider, so for example, in the first level, will you have a smaller divisions so that our citizens, our consumers can ch choose an appliance that is the most electricity efficient? That is already done by the, uh, the Eurozone. Third question is about some LPG taxis and buses will change the catalytic uh, uh, reductors. And we do hear some suggestion is that the new uh, reductor is actually not very efficient. And sometimes they, they can't start the engine. So are there some numbers about this? Can we do some testing on these devices? And lastly, it's about some buildings, the energy consumption of these buildings. So we see that a lot of electricity is, is used in the air conditioning systems. Now, some of the old ones, so, some, some, of the thing that, some, some people think that we should use a newer type in terms of a using water coolant system. But they may be involve a lot of capital cost in terms of uh, changing the installation, buying new machines, or changing the planning. So it may this this and the sum may only be returned only after three to five years. So can the uh, governments do some encouragement procedures? Can we encourage, uh, especially uh, large shopping malls? Perhaps they have only money, but perhaps uh, SMEs can help them to uh, lower their electricity consumption. So we have several colleagues who can answer this. In terms of uh, labeling, in terms and in terms of uh, building energy consumption, some co my some of my colleagues can add to this. But a member have asked in any subsidizing plans. This will need a comprehensive review, and this is something that we have to look into, and we're developing policies. And we're talking about of Hong Kong in terms of a climate change policy or energy policy to help uh, Hong Kong lower emissions, such as in buildings, uh, such as what kind of the devices will be most effective. So what would need subsidize and what doesn't, it's something that needs a long-term review. But we do see that some projects, as my colleagues will supplement, 
And the first question is about uh, bus route rationalization. In terms of bus route rationalization, the main purpose is not to lower emissions. I'll say this first. I think everyone knows this. But rationalization, if it is successful, what effects will it bring? From our point, if the flow of traffic is faster, that can help lower emissions. So what we're responsible for uh, and is that we uh, do it at the source to try to get buses to uh, lower emissions. So when we're talking about uh, implementing these SCs, and I won't repeat here. May I ask my colleague to answer the other two questions? Yes, uh, thank you for the member's question. I would like to answer in terms of two areas. First, in terms of the labeling of electric appliances. Now, this has been done for some time, and we do think it's time to have a review. Now, it's not just about electrical appliances, but in terms of the standard, in terms of energy efficiency. Now, uh, the relevant department is already doing the review, and we hope to have one before the end of the year. But because in terms of the different levels, we do have to consider different factors. Now, before the review, we can say what the results would be at this point. But I think that we had to balance several things. First, we're talking about electric appliances. We're talking about uh, uh, what kind of appliances. And we also want to see that will the label be easy to be understood by the consumers. Of course, if the divisions are fine, then we'll be have more information, but it'll be easy for the consumers to understand. It's something that we have to consider. In terms of review, we hope that will be done by the end, before the end of the year. And another area is about the energy efficiency of buildings. And a lot of times we're talking about air conditioning or other installations. Of course, there's some time before they can get their uh, expenditures back, get their returns. So, so whether or not they can change the installation is not just about cost, and it's also about feasibility. Now, I'm talking about some buildings that are kind of old, whether or not they can uh, completely stop air conditioning for a time to change the insulations, that is something that we have to consider. In terms of a subsidizing, and earlier the administration has, uh, in terms of a building's energy efficiency, has taken a, a subsidy plan. So we do see that in Hong Kong, there's one out of seven buildings that is being benefiting from this subsidy. Of course, each particular building, in terms of what they want to uh, change the insulation, it really depends on their individual needs and in, in regards to what you're talking about in terms of air conditioning. Now, the electrical mechanical department is doing some work on this, and perhaps I would like to ask Mr. Lee from the department to supplement here from the EMSD. Yes, thank you. In terms of the suggestion from Mr. Kwok, in terms of a labeling first, as Mrs. Ma has talked, now from a voluntary scheme it has been changed now, and it's been implemented for more than 10 years. In the earlier two years, we have um, started this uh, energy efficiency labeling of products ordinance. Now, for certain products, such as uh, air conditioners, we divide it into five different levels of energy efficiency. And about other, uh, other, other appliances, such as uh, energy-saving light bulbs, we don't have this division. Now, this division is usually uh, in accordance with the international standards and testing standards to set these uh, labels. In terms of the one to five levels, is in accordance to international standards. And f Mr. Kwok also said that uh, has a correct direction because some countries have doing this in a longer way and s because they have uh, done this as a vanguard and so they have a very effectiveness. So in the level one or so, they want to divide it even further to 1A or 1B. Some countries are already doing this and we are starting to uh, review this uh, system. 
is for a grade one product. Um, but in fact, it may find itself in a wide range of products for air conditioners. Even for grade one air conditioners, we still have further classifications. Say, for example, you can talk about the output. Say, for example, whether it has a horsepower one or one and a half. And then uh, we'll look at the operating conditions and we'll look at the uh, amount of energy to be consumed, like the kilowatt, amount of kilowatt. Now, if uh, members of the public would like to get a product which is energy efficient, uh, he may be interested to find out about the final details for using water to cool the air. We have had shortage of water, so we have never encouraged the use of water to cool the air. When we can afford it, in terms of energy efficiency, water cooling systems are better than air cooling systems, a saving of 18%. So for buildings which have the conditions ripe, they can change from air cooling to water cooling. However, they have to meet certain conditions if they want to do the migration. There's the loading factor, and for you to switch over to a water cooling system, generally speaking, if you use fresh water, you may be susceptible to the um, infectious disease, and then um, therefore we have to ask for better repair maintenance. Otherwise, uh, you may uh, spread an infectious disease. Um, we understand that for the water cooling system, um, you need to find ways to drain away the water accumulated. So there may be some problem about um, this burden. Therefore, uh, we need the cooperation of a number of government departments to look at the design as well as other uh, standards required of us. Therefore, it takes time to um, give approval. But um, all along, we have been uh, holding a cross-departmental working party, and we do provide one-stop service, and uh, it may spread the uh, Legionella uh, disease. Um, generally speaking, I won't be interrupting public officers who speak, but I will ask you to be brief. There is one other question that hasn't to be answered. No, I have to keep it till next time, otherwise it's not fair to the other members. Dr. Helena Wong. Um, clean fuel and renewable energy, like solar energy and wind power. For the power companies, of course, we can impose a certain percentage of the power to be generated to come from clean fuels. It is said that it's very costly. Yes, we know that there is a number of um, windmills, there are a number of windmills on Lama Island, but it can only generate very small amounts of energy. So I want to know whether the administration will be um, initiating the studies, otherwise uh, another 100 years will pass and we won't be able to see anything being accomplished. Uh, Singapore and South Korea, which we just visited, have done a lot in this regard. Now, marine emission, SO2, um, half of the SO2 and the 3 percent um, of another pollutant also come from the marine source. 
And then in Annex 2, it is said that uh, we have got three pieces of legislation to regulate the problem. I did make an attempt to look at them. CAP 313, it was enacted one day before the handover. And then CAP 548, it was amended in year 2007. I did not have time to check the second one in your table. I want to know whether you have examined or reviewed the three pieces of legislation to see if they are adequate or not. Um, if they are already outdated, do you have a timetable to review them? Well, for CAP 313, um, I think only Section 49 and Section 50 are relevant to uh, emissions from vessels. And then it only refers to smoke. And then they talk about the ash and other things. But you don't actually talk about SO2, NOx, or RSP. So I don't know how the two can be read together. Because it seems that in one case you are using layman terms, and in another case you're using more scientific terms. And then the other section reads as follows. You can't emit an amount of smoke which will cause nuisance. I think it is too subjective. There isn't any objective yardstick. So I think you're talking about the ash and also the residue only. So it seems that uh, the two sections aren't really adequate. It seems that um, they are um, too outdated in terms of the regulation. So perhaps you need to look at legislative amendments in tandem. Well, in fact, indeed, we are amending the law and we dealt with it at the last meeting. Well, the PC meetings did address this point, and the THB has also made certain undertakings. So um, let me answer the member's question. For renewable energy, in Hong Kong, We have to look at the potential of renewable energy. Please bear with me. I can understand that uh, a few years ago, the Hong Kong UST carried out a survey looking at the potential of renewable energy. Uh, as far as solar energy and wind energy is concerned, our potential is quite low. A few years ago, there was a debate about the development of wind power. Both power companies were able to identify sites which could see the development of wind power. Um, the project hasn't been finalized because even if both have been completed, it would at most be contributing to 1 to 2 percent of the total energy consumed, but then it will entail huge investments, and eventually the public would have to pick up the bill. So um, maybe one day the conclusion is that it is not worth the investment. Now, you can um, look at it from this perspective, that is whether it is worthwhile. For our energy policy, we hope that maybe within this year's time, we can uh, present our ideas concerning our energy policy. So perhaps that could be addressed within that context. Now, if the government is asked to subsidize a particular mode of power generation, in which form should we invest? 
It is not an easy answer, a question to answer. We are a small city. We need to look at our power generation. That's the first point. The second point is that we are in a position to buy energy, to buy electricity from the mainland, and it will have a bearing on the electricity market. So perhaps that can be taken up within the context of the energy policy and the energy market. What about emissions from vessels? Mr. Chairman, in relation to emissions from vessels, we are indeed very concerned. We are going to have um, new policies to deal with it, and we may have to enact new legislation. Three examples from Ms. Wong. For local vessels, we would like to tighten up the standards of the quality of fuel. The sulfur content is 0.5% of the diesel, and we believe that uh, we can change it to 0.05%. And in fact, uh, in March, at the Environmental Affairs Panel of the LegCo, we consulted the members, and we have already got your agreement. We are now drafting the bill together with the D of J, and we would like to present it to you within this year. Then the second point is about the ocean-going vehicles. In the policy address, the CE has already said that by way of legislation, we should make sure that the OGVs would have a fuel switch when they birth. This is because they are using heavy fuel oil, and then the sulfur content is 3% or 3.5%. We have talked to the tray and would like to lower the sulfur content from no more than 3.5% to 0.5%, um, which is a low sulfur fuel. The former standard is imposed by the IMO. And then we have the shipping and port control ordinance and the Merchant Shipping Prevention of Air Pollution Regulation. Well, uh, early this year, the PAC had a discussion, and then the Secretary for Transport and Housing has already said that there would be an amendment to the law so that we can tighten up the standards. It is said that the amendment legislation will be introduced to the LegCo soon. Well, you have asked um, your questions in the first round, so it's now my turn. I want to ask a question related to health, since we are talking about issues relating to air, noise, and light pollution. I think roadside pollution is the greatest nuisance. When we worked on the bill concerning the ban on idle engines, it is said that for vehicles that are running on idle engines, they have been causing the biggest problem to roadside hawkers and street level shopkeepers. For buses as well as other vehicles which are running on idle engines, what about the health risk? Can you elaborate on the health risk? Um, when compared with air pollution from other sources, I want to know whether the nature of the health risk is different. Is it more dangerous or what? And what about the types of diseases to be caused? Would it be different? And then for uh, roadside pollution, it is going to affect us a lot. And so um, later on, we are going to ask a question about the cause benefit analysis. Shouldn't we also look at the health impact so that we can focus our resources on um, reduction of vehicle emission and roadside pollution? Because in this way, we can better safeguard the health of the urban dwellers. 
and then last time when we looked at the ban on idle engines, the Polytechnic U said that we could have a cooling system mounted on the roof rack of a vehicle using solar energy. Um, I want to know uh, about the progress of that R&D. Uh, first, to answer your second question, in terms of the Hong Kong Productivity Council has a device that can help in terms of uh, stopping idling engines. I believe that these devices can be implemented by the industry. If they think it's feasible, they can use it. And uh, we, we have a new policies to say that you must use this device. Uh, at this point, we do not have this uh, idea. But, of course, the ordinance has already ha been implemented. Now, second, in terms of the health concerns, in terms of your uh, overall p p comprehensive idea, I don't have any doubts about that. But in terms of the medical concerns about how to affect us, but I think it really has to be concerned about where your nose is. If your nose is a very, of course, it will never be at the chimney of a power generator. But most of the time, we are close to roads. Now, there are two types of pollution. One is in the atmosphere, because that's everywhere. Second is about the roadside, and that will come from vehicles. Now, I'm talking about vehicles. If you ask some experts, such as the Professor Headley, the answer has always been that uh, different things can affect the heart and the respiration. That if you want him to explain more as to how there or what kind of symptoms will arise, I don't think they will be more. They can be more detailed. But certainly, if your concentration is about this high, and then if Hong Kong people are on the roadside for a certain percentage of time, of course some people are actually working by the road, and perhaps they'll be by the roadside for eight hours. And perhaps if we, so people like us who just ride in cars, then we'll be less. Uh, academics have uh, different uh, measuring standards, and they can give you an approximate number, but they won't uh, give you have any hesitation about how they should spend the money if you want to improve the health. So the most direct impact will definitely be roadside traffic because it affects the most people. So the government is using a, such a big sum of money because, in, to, in, uh, in terms of three different items, one for buses, one for uh, heavy vehicles, and one for others. So we use a very large sum of money for this. Yes. So we're saying that we use this uh, three-pronged strategy: is legislation, administration process, as well as uh, funding allocation. Now, if we want to decrease roadside pollution, and we look see this, that there is an ordinance such as uh, banning the idling engineering, and then we use other subsidies such as changing pipes or to t pilot scheme uh, electric taxis and buses. But the undersecretary, you've always said that there's a carrot, and we also need a stick. No, then the stick will need your help. Do you have any sticks? No. So why don't we say that? Perhaps with changing the diesel buses, then uh, after a certain number of years, then you can't have them anymore. Second, some uh, as we don't, maybe we shouldn't argue. The department head has said, in terms of catalytic reduction devices, some people are arguing about who should give money. So that's why the first time the government was subsidized. But in the future, the industry, whether or not they will be willing to uh, bear this cost because they may have to change it uh, in the one or two years. It's not very clear right now, but the government's standpoint is that we will just give this the first time. But you look at some of our figures. We, all these measures we've taken, this, we use so much money in the next few years, how much emission will be reduced? Then well, we may think that it's not going to be enough, but you can see that even though we've done so much, we, if we can lower reduction by 40%, that's not enough. And you say that we have to reduce it more. Then how should we do it? 
so in the future we may have to spend more money. So that may be in accordance with your thinking that if we want to reduce even more emission in a very dramatic way, what else can we do? Okay, in terms of uh, the pipes, how much is it? That is uh, in terms of operating costs for the vehicle owner. How much is this? Now, Madam Chair, perhaps I can also answer the question from member previously from Mr. Kwok. Now, in terms of the one-off subsidy, that's a uh, one thousand uh, taxis and light buses to change the pipes. Now, we've only ended the tender process for procurement, so we have found some suppliers for. Uh, supplying this procurement as well as the garages to do this work. So our tendering process has just ended, and now we are reviewing the different tenders. We hope that within these three months we can announce the results, and then we can do a mass scale uh, change, uh, changing of the pipes. So so it's not. So we're just still in the procurement stage. If there are any incidents in the communities, they're not going to be related to us because we haven't started this. If we look at the results, not talking about the tender results, talking about at the uh, the prices that are used by the people in the community, it's only seven, several thousand dollars. They can use a year or two. So in terms of the operating costs for taxis and light buses, we think that is something that's affordable. So we hope that the buses, the government, after giving this one-off subsidy, then in the future the vehicle owner will be responsible for this. This is to be the same as uh, privately owned vehicles. But if we see that the pipes is not effective and they haven't changed it, then we'll make sure that they have to change, uh, make, do an implementation. Uh, Mr. Tony, to please, ten minutes. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Now, because of air, uh, the power generators is one of the most significant. Uh, causes of emissions. I see that there is a standard here. I would like to ask, in terms of uh, enforcement of standards, is that something that's done by the EB? Second, in terms of a uh, using of energy, of course the buildings is the major player here. I would like to say that I have contacted uh, many uh, landowners. So, as in terms of a subsidize. They think that it will be a big incentive. So, if I go to some private estates, so for example, instead of light installation or in terms of electricity, they have taken measures to reduce energy consumption. So, I know that the government has some subsidies for them. So, this is a great incentive for them, and not just for uh, buildings that that's not owned by one uh, individual. So now, of course, if you're talking about uh, shopping malls and such, to change the air installation, air conditioning systems. So, for example, I think this has been done uh, several years ago. They have a good returns on this. So over the past 22, so I think they get the money back even within 10 months because of the saving on electricity cost. So we hope that the government can do more on this because for buildings that are owned by different uh, land and uh, different owners, some of the installations, if they want to change it, they will need consensus among different owners. So I hope that there will be some uh, subsidies to f uh, ease the control of this. So I just want to make my points here. And there's also the point about uh, vehicles. Now, in term for preventing the idling engines, so I want to know that how much time. So, will you have a midterm review of the effectiveness, and perhaps you can also consider, as the Madam Chair had said, some uh, measures, so to let them remember to turn off their engines. And I think a lot of people do do this voluntarily, but because uh, summer is coming, so it's something that we must consider. So just these three simple areas. So who will answer, please? So perhaps the deputy director first. Uh, first, I can talk about the electricity. Now, the EPD and the EB's division of power is that the EB will do in terms of a price and the energy. 
In terms of the pollution, is from the EPD. Every two years, we will have a uh, new technical memorandum with the uh, power companies to regulate this. Now, EPD actually has implemented a sensor within the chimney of the power grid. So we do implement, we do monitor this for 24 hours a day. So we can see very clearly whether or not it's above the standard. So we've been doing this uh, all throughout. Second, in terms of uh, electricity, uh, about uh, light installation or elevators, such as things, I'm just going to give a suggestion. Now, in terms of uh, buildings, I agree with you that if they can do more energy efficient installations, they can't get the money back. It's only the whether how long or how sh this will ta take. Now, of course, the subsidies can successfully help some buildings to shorten the time to get the money back. But of course, there are some uh, concerns is that it will be some difficult if a building has different owners because they must get consensus. <coughs> Of course, in a subsidizing plan, we do see some buildings have not been able to benefit from this because they couldn't get a consensus, because they do need to get a consensus before they apply. But we can say that in the future, we don't need to be so pessimistic, because under the Buildings Energy Efficiency Ordinance, in the future, with their mixed-use building or commercial-use building, we need to have an energy audit. and. They have to do it once every 10 years, by a minimum. So after this audit, then we can let the owners know that how they can uh, decrease the energy consumption so that they can have an incentive to uh, r r change the insulations to improve their energy efficiency. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Taylor, do you have anything to add? Vehicles, anything to uh, to review the... the uh, efficiency of the ban on idling engines. It's very difficult to enforce, I think. And of course, and it sometimes it may even cause a lot of fights. I missed a lie. In terms of uh, banning idling uh, engines, it's effective in 2011, December, and then to the March of this year. So we have liaised with uh, the uh, traffic control. So we have 10 uh, charges. So well, how effective is this? I think it's very difficult to assess. On one point, we don't hope to arrest a lot of people. It's not that we don't enforce it. It's that we hope that the drivers can voluntarily uh, start this habit, will uh, take off, will uh, turn off the engine, so we don't have to enforce it by ourselves. So we hope to do a lot of our promotion work. And we do see that a lot of drivers will develop this habit. In terms of enforcement, as the, Madam Chair has mentioned, because right now, if we want to enforce this, our enforcement personnel needs to be next to the vehicle. We we'll have, we'll have to take measure that the time will have be three minutes before we uh, issue a charge. Now, if a uh, Uniform personnel goes next to them, and the driver doesn't still ignore them. They will be hard. Then you think it's understandable that we haven't uh, taken a charge of a lot of people. So under the ordinance, we will continue to use the advertisement as well as enforcement measures to enforce it. Now, the, as Madam Chair had said that uh, Poly U has uh, in, invented some device so that. Uh, vehicles can uh, stop can uh, stop the engines and still have air condition, but some of the problem is that, as I understand, it will take a uh, ten or twenty thousand dollars. Will a vehicle owner to use this for the air condition, or will it think that I'll just uh, be a little bit hotter and don't install this device? Now, Madam Chair, I'm not really worried about how many chargers there were, but I think that as an observer uh, to see how effective it is. If it's not effective, then perhaps we can do different measures. Of course, I may have to take this beyond this panel, because a lot of times 
a lot of times uh, there's a disconnect between the study and uh, implementation, and perhaps we need to uh, launch this more in the long term. But I don't think it's important whether or not how many charges there are. The most important thing is that people will remember and then they are willing to uh, suffer a little bit. So I think that the EB can do more promotions to uh, remind everyone. So I think that is what my concern is. So perhaps we, in the later people will forget it and so go back to old habits. Because it's difficult to uh, give a ticket. It's difficult, I know that. But I think it's more important that people will remember on their own. So that's all I want to add. Yes, everyone knows that it's very difficult to enforce. It's something that we had already discussed. Uh, Mr. Crockway Kirk, on the second round. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, in terms of uh, vessels, the low sulfur uh, fuel. Looking at the document, we see that the government, the administration, wants to make tighter uh, restrictions to less than 0 0.5 for OGVs and to 0 0.05 for locally supplied marine light diesels. Now, in an earlier meeting, I had mentioned that for local uh, vessels, well, they can they use uh, hybrid fuels. As everyone knows, that Hong Kong in the future um, will perhaps will increase our facilities in this area. So we are concerned that how can we uh, launch more products to the market so that uh, from our food waste we can uh, be more effectively composted. So now, in terms of this, is it because this uh, biofuels is a higher cost, so we could, administration will not consider this? Now, if the emission is about the same, can we do more promotions to use more biofuel, even though both of them are expensive, but can we consider use more? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you got time. Well, I hope that this can be uh, subsumed under the energy policy. As we can imagine that in Europe, they do have legislation to mandate the use of such fuel. Say, for example, in the case of vehicles, uh, are we ready to do this in Hong Kong? We know that there are two manufacturers and probably we can use it on a larger scale. And the manufacturers have already publicized and they say that there will be sufficient biofuel to enable each and every vehicle in Hong Kong to make use of it. If you want to use it, it's fine. But if you want to promote it, we have to see whether it is a policy. For the time being, I can't say much, but I think this can be discussed within the context of energy policy. You are not disallowed to include 5% of the biofuel into your fuel, right? Uh, let me talk about the topic and then my colleague would comment on the challenges posed. Now for vessel emission, we want to tighten it from 0.5% to 0.05% in relation to the sulfur content. The SO2 emission will be greatly reduced. We've talked to the fishing vessel owners as well as the shipping industry. We carried out a test. We tried to use better quality fuel in older engines, and it does it did work. Of course, cost would be a concern. No one would reject better quality fuel, but they will be concerned about the dollar sign. Now, for the zero point zero five percent 
view, it is uh, in greater demand in Asia. So the price, when compared with the higher sulfur content oil, uh, the price difference is only 1%. And it is against such a background we are able to secure the support of the shipping industry to accept our proposal to tighten up the uh, requirements concerning sulfur content. We need to consider the cost difference or the price difference. We need to make the first step as to the question of biofuels. Uh, maybe Mr. Pang can also elaborate. Thank you, Madam Chair. For biofuel, it can be used on vehicles. Um, our law does spec stipulate the requirements for vehicles. For vessels, we have to be more cautious. For the Director of Marine, the Director is very concerned about shipping safety. This is different from vehicles. For vehicles to have the engines stored, it is easy to get support. The vehicles can be towed, but then when a vessel is at sea, when you encounter a marine incident, uh, the consequences could have been much more serious. Therefore, the quality of fuel will be subject to a higher sort of standard. When we try to tighten up the requirement concerning the sulfur content, we say that the fuel has to meet international standards. For biofuels, if they meet international requirements, of course they can be used. But then it is posing quite a big challenge. For fuel coming from a oil refinery, it is easier to meet the international requirements. Let me follow this up. Not too long ago, a member sponsored a motion debate on biofuel and the cost of collecting information. We underwent a learning process. When it comes to aviation fuel, KLM is now flying flights on biofuel. The standard must be high before it can be used in aviation. So is it because of the substandard uh, quality of our biofuel in Hong Kong that you're worried that there may be accidents? If biofuel can be used in aviation, is it because they have a lower level of requirement or what? But I can imagine that for an airplane to be caught in an incident, the consequence could also be dire. So are you saying that we haven't got the conditions to produce high quality biofuel and so we're not in a position to do this? For airplanes, usually they would use kerosene for airplanes. Usually they don't use diesel. So if a particular air company would like to use biofuel, probably they have to adapt to this particular kind of fuel. We also understand that Dr. Ko agrees that for biofuel it can be used in industrial processes like um, laundry um, industries uh, because even when the engine stalls, there won't be any problems. And in fact, we have invited the disciplined services to give favorable condition or favorable consideration to the use of biofuel. They can ask the contractor to use it, or they they can use it in their um, in their laundry plant. Mr. Kwok, have you got any follow up? Well, I don't want to wait for any of you to ask me to have a quorum count. I just want to thank the public officers for their attendance. I want to thank members who attended. So for 
today's meeting. I will just call it a day earlier than usual. Thank you. Wow, I forgot. Thank you.